Hello, and welcome to the Walrus Leadership Forum, The Great Skill Shift. I'm Jennifer Hollett. I'm the Executive Director of the Walrus, and we're thrilled to be joining you online and across the country. We'll start by acknowledging the land that we're on, as this is an integral piece to what we'll be hearing and learning today. The land is not neutral. There's history and colonization. A land acknowledgement helps us recognize where the story starts, what happened in the past, thinking about how it informs where we are today, and what changes can be made going forward in a commitment to reconciliation. I'm in downtown Toronto, Ontario, to Toronto. I come to you from the traditional territories of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. Toronto has long been a meeting place for Indigenous peoples, and we're honoured to carry a tradition of storytelling and conversation. I'd like to invite you to join me in reflecting for a moment on the land that you're on, wherever you're joining us from, and the moment in history that we're in. A bit about the walrus. The Walrus started 18 years ago, really as an optimistic project to tell the stories of, of Canadians and to foster conversation. And we do this in a number of ways, through fact-based journalism, which you can find in our print edition, but also online at our website, thewalrus.ca, on our podcast, The Conversation Piece, and an event series like this one. And this work is powered by our donors, our supporters and our partners. So thank you all for joining us. We're a charity, so the support of our sponsors is crucial in convening. And we're so pleased to be partnering with RBC on this event today. RBC has been supporting the Walrus journalism and events for more than a decade now, and has been an instrumental supporter of Canadian writers, writers and artists through its Emerging Artists Program. Today, we're going to be hearing about the findings from RBC's new report on bridging the digital divide for Indigenous communities and youth, and this will be followed by commentary and insights from our esteemed panel. To start this conversation on the great skill shift, I'd like to welcome John Stackhouse, RBC's Senior Vice President in the Office of the CEO. Hello, John. How are you? Uh, thank you again, uh, everyone. I'll uh, just get straight into what we're here to talk about, which is the skills revolution. But but seizing on that last point about healthcare in this country, we have uh, great access to education and to skills development across this country, but it's not nearly what it needs to be. And it's not nearly what it needs to be in the coming tech revolution, which is what I'm going to get to today. And most acutely, it's not what it has to be for the indigenous youth who are going to be critical to this country in the 2020s and, uh, and 2030s. We're really on a hinge of history and we'll come out of COVID, uh, but we've got a, a, in some ways a bigger hinge of history to come to grips with and that's the tech hinge. We are seeing algorithms, quantum computing, drones, robots, doing now in more and more sophisticated ways. We see this at RBC, we see it through our clients and in our communities, doing it in more powerful and sophisticated ways every day, every month, every year. Generally, this is a good thing for society, but it also means we as humans have to uh, shift and we as humans have to really embold, um, be bolder with the human skills that make us all uh, different, but also allow us to work with, uh, work with technology. With this in mind, we have two real mega trends uh, coming together, intersecting in this country. One is this, this tech revolution. Some call it the fourth industrial revolution, smart machines uh, doing a lot of what humans used to do through, uh, through history. Then we have another mega trend of indigenous youth now the largest, fastest growing demographic in the country. Our report shows 750,000 uh, Indigenous Canadians coming into the workforce in the, in, in, in the 2020s. This is an enormous opportunity for them, for their communities, uh, but also for us as a country, if we can connect it with, that, uh, with, uh, with those tech revolutions. How do we do that? And how do we do that in the context of what we have gone through this summer. This was a, a historic summer, a very painful summer for uh, Canadians, I, and, and, and I hope a sobering one for Canadians. I'm reminded of that every time I walk by a flagpole and see flags at half mast. And I think, how do we together 
hoist that flag when the time is right and in a way that is appropriate, because we're going to have to hoist those flags together. Well, one way is to invest in Indigenous youth, something we've committed to as a country uh, and we've fallen short on. As, uh, as, as a country, but we have an opportunity, which is what our report B Building ba Bandwidth gets at, and it's something we can, uh, we can really double down on coming out of COVID. We came at this re re report inspired by some previous research from RBC. One, was, uh, one piece was a, a, a report called Humans Wanted, which we published in 2018 that looked at this fourth industrial revolution and the human capacity, that's why we called the report Humans Wanted, that we thought was such a terrific opportunity for Canadians going into the 2020s to use those human skills of creativity, communication, critical thinking, and power the machines, not let the machines power us. But we were also inspired by a piece of research RBC did 20 plus years ago called The Cost of Doing Nothing. And this came out after the Royal Commission on uh, Aboriginals People, uh, on Aboriginal Peoples. Those of us of a certain age will remember that. And our colleague Phil Fontaine uh, here at RBC, who was so instrumental to, uh, to the work around that report and in the years since, uh, has really been pushing us to do more in thought leadership, more in economics research uh, from an Indigenous perspective. So we put together a research team led by uh, a colleague, Tracy Smith, who is Mohawk uh, and runs her own NGO for uh, youth. Tr uh, Tracy joined us for this uh, project. And we reached out across the country to Indigenous groups, to uh, communities, to youth groups, to employers, to put together conversations, roundtables, talking sessions, to over the last couple of years, really better understand the opportunity for Indigenous youth with this tech revolution, but also how we can come at the tech revolution and education and skills development, maybe from an indigenous perspective uh, and, and learn uh, from, from, from that and do it maybe in ways that other countries are not doing it. It was so inspiring. Uh, I was privileged to, uh, to be able to travel across the country before COVID, but also virtually to talk to uh, indigenous youth, uh, including techies from Google and Shopify and Microsoft uh, about their own choices, about their businesses, for those who are entrepreneurs, about their communities and what they needed uh, from Canada or what they saw as the opportunity for Canada. We've had this report ready to go this spring and we delayed it because of Kamloops and thought a lot about and talked a lot, including with indigenous communities about maybe delaying it longer, but felt this is too important to reconciliation. This is about an investment and in the spirit of walrus optimism about something not easy to do, but something that we can uh, collectively do and have to do uh, coming out of both the COVID crisis, but also the, uh, the, the, the social, political and economic crisis that we've been through together this summer. We're going to hear a lot of great ideas on this from uh, from the panel, but if I can just seed that conversation with a few of the findings quickly from the report and recommendations uh, before handing over the, the mic, I'd point to the following from the key findings. Number one, Indigenous youth, as I mentioned, fastest growing cohort of Canadian youth uh, with their numbers expanding four times uh, at the rate of non-Indigenous population. This is a serious thing that all Canadians need to uh, invest in. This cohort represents 7% of all Canadian youth, but it's approaching one third in the Yukon, in Manitoba and Saskatchewan, 60% in the Northwest uh, Territories. Third point, Indigenous high school graduation rates are improving. This is something we committed to 25 years ago, and we've done reasonably well, lots of problems, but uh, there, there have been improvements. But only 45% of Indigenous Canadians aged 24 to 35 have a post-secondary education. And as we all know, uh, increasingly in this economy and in this tech-enabled world, we need uh, people need post-secondary educations to thrive and prosper uh, and to fulfill their, their dreams in many ways in an increasingly digital world. Fourth, we found that nearly two-thirds of jobs held by Indigenous workers, nearly two-thirds are at risk of a skills overhaul in the coming decade. Those algorithms and robots and drones that I mentioned earlier are disrupting those jobs are not eliminating the jobs, but they are leading to shifts in the requirements for those jobs. So how do we ensure that Indigenous youth, whether they're going to work in a mining operation or a forestry company or start their own business uh, uh, in, in whatever sector it may be, have the skills to uh, thrive? And then the last point I thought worth highlighting was a survey we did through RBC Future Launch 
that uh, surveyed indigenous youth across the country and found, of course, they're frequently using digi digital devices, as we all are, but especially this generation is, but they're less confident in their digital literacy skills than their non-Indigenous peers. There's a confidence gap there that, uh, that we have to think through and uh, work with various communities to, uh, to address. So what, are the, what, what can we do about it? Lots of good ideas, and I'm sure we'll hear more about what's actually going on uh, uh, out there from our panelists. But there's four things I just want to quickly cite uh, before handing over the mic. They're all Cs, so I uh, hope you can remember these four Cs. We need to focus on confidence, curriculum, connectivity, and creativity. Confidence, just addressing that confidence gap, helping these 750,000 Indigenous youth build the confidence to know that whatever they are doing, they can thrive and lead in a digitally enabled age. Secondly, curriculum. We've got to get to work on the curriculum uh, from K to PhD uh, from an Indigenous perspective. Uh, this is a national conversation, but from an Indigenous perspective to take advantage of the opportunities that are emerging in the world. We have to invest in connectivity, of course, broadband. That's why we called our report or our report building uh, bandwidth. We have to invest in uh, physical connectivity uh, through uh, serious broadband investments across the country, but also uh, human connectivity through networks and mentorships. Uh, be interested to hear from the panelists what uh, what they see as the opportunities there. And then lastly, creativity. We did another research report this year on the age of creativity, uh, which we're just getting uh, into. Uh, and this is going to be a post-COVID uh, phenomenon. This is a creative age, and this is a huge opportunity for these Indigenous youth, whatever they're doing, to be creators uh, and uh, to uh, work together as creators in their communities whether those be physical communities or digital communities that we can all uh, uh, benefit benefit from. So let me uh, wrap up there and hand, uh, hand things back to, uh, to uh, Jennifer and the team and really looking forward to hearing, uh, hearing more and more ideas. But Jennifer, thank you again for including us today. Thank you, John and RVC. Great overview of building bandwidth and the four C's, confidence, curriculum, connectivity, and creativity. Nice to see you, John. I'll get you to turn off your video. And now I'm going to set up our panelists. I must say, as someone who works at the intersection of digital media and journalism, I know that everyone deserves equal access to both education, but also the digital resources needed. And we should be using our platforms to ultimately shine a light on inclusive practices, which includes digital access for everyone. It's not a new topic, but more and more, it's at the forefront of our minds because of the economy, uh, this pandemic, never ending pandemic, it feels like that we're in, and the new skills and learning that it requires. And while we're focusing on Indigenous youth, it impacts every one of us. Uh, um, but it plays out different for those in societies who have not had the same opportunities and access to platforms and education. To lead our Q&A in conversation, and thanks for all the questions coming in from chat. Keep it coming. We're monitoring those and hope to get to as many as your questions as possible. Please join me in welcoming our moderator, Madeline Redfern. Madeline is the Chief Operating Officer at Can Arctic Inuit Networks. She is also a member of the National Indigenous Economic Development Consortium and Arctic 360 a former mentor and current board member of the Pierre Elliott Trudeau Foundation, the president of a Yungi group in Northern Robotics, and a special advisor to the Canadian Nuclear Laboratories and the Ultra Safe Nuclear Corporation. She is joining us from McAllowit. Welcome, Madeline. Good morning, Jennifer, and good morning, everyone. First of all, I'd like to thank the Walrus for helping to facilitate what I think is an incredibly important uh, conversation and engagement on broadband and the digital divide. I'd also like to take the time to thank uh, John for and RBC for the important work that they've done in producing that report. Um, uh, it's called Building Bandwidth, Preparing Indigenous Youth for a Digital Adult Divide. It's online. I highly recommend people uh, look it up and read it. 
and as John explained, and uh, how important um, this is towards achieving Indigenous reconciliation in our country. We know that broadband is essential um, and, a, and a human right, actually, it's been declared by many across the world. And it's necessary for governance, for education, for health, and it also helps our Indigenous communities and people develop economies. And these investments are necessary to also help facilitate Indigenous economic reconciliation. So I'm going to introduce the panelists that are joining us today. Uh, first of all, Oscar Baker III from Elza Buktuk. He currently lives in Indian Island. He's a journalist and winner of the David Adams Richards Award for nonfiction writing. Welcome, Oscar. Well, Mina Dalhousie, Oscar. Um, I'm Black and Mi'kmaq from Elza Buktuk First Nation, and uh, I'm glad to be taking part of this panel today. Thank you. Also joining us is Martha Hall Findlay, the Chief Sustainability Officer for Suncor. Welcome, Martha. Thank you very much. Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you. And our next panelist is Mike Degagne. He's the President and the CEO for Inspired. Mm -hmm. Good morning. Hi, everybody. Excellent. So the way that this is going to work, just so that people who are joining us is, is I actually have a few questions for each of our panelists. Uh, they're going to share their insights and, and views. Uh, I've also asked that if there's another one of the panelists who has, you know, something they'd like to add, they're more than welcome to, to do so. And then I'm going to try to make sure that we do leave enough uh, time at the end to ensure that audience questions are also able to be asked to our amazing panelists that we have today. So the first question is uh, I'm going to pose to Oscar. In what way do you think larger corporations and companies can work towards true connectivity, especially in our indigenous communities in the rural remote areas of this country? Uh, quite frankly, it, it comes down to um, investment, um, investing in with uh, capital and money. Um, a lot of our communities, um, I can only really speak to the communities that I've covered here in Mi'kma'ki. Uh, a lot of them suffer from um, uh, poverty and um, some of those students uh, don't have the opportunities to have the, equip the proper equipment to learning those digital skills. Um, some of our communities are away from uh, urban centers, so they're quite rural and struggle for that connectivity. Um, so it, it would go a long way uh, to capac capacity building uh, with you know, proper investments when it, when it, came to, when it comes to uh, things like laptops, uh, securing better Wi-Fi and uh, cellular uh, services within those communities. And um, as a, I guess a personal note, um, I would love to see more companies investing in um, mentorships and bringing along um, Indigenous youth and with skills and training and acknowledging that there might be a gap, um, but having a clear roadmap to building them, uh, building them up, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Oscar. Uh, Mike or Martha, is there anything that you want to add on that uh, on that topic before I ask you your questions? Oh, there is so much I'd want to <laughs> add. The first one being, Oscar, you and I need to talk because Suncor has decades of, of experience working with communities. Now, we are in Alberta, based in Alberta, although we have operations across Canada and, and, and globally. Uh, we also have, I mean, we're a fully integrated energy company, so we we produce oil, we upgrade, we refine, we distribute through our, our coast to coast Petro Canada network. Um, we have offshore uh, operations both off the east coast of Canada, but also in, in, in Norway and, and, and the UK. Um, but right now for today, the important things are, for example, that over 40 of our Petro Canada branded stations are now owned by Indigenous uh, uh, operators. 
We um, are by far the single largest procurer of goods and services from Indigenous communities. Now, I, I will be the first to say um, the focus of that activity has been in the Fort McMurray region, and there are a number of communities in the Fort Mac region that have actually established significant economic prosperity, which we don't see across the country. There's no question. But what that shows us is that that level of engagement, so over the decades, we've gone from uh, you know, hiring Indigenous employees, including, by the way, we have an extensive Indigenous mentoring, youth mentoring program at Suncorp. But it's evolved over the years to uh, working to develop capacity for us to procure goods and services. That in turn has allowed to the point of significant equity partnerships. So a few years ago, we did the, Fort, uh, the East Tank Farm, a 49% partnership with Fort Mackay and Miccosukee Cree First Nations. That has been fantastic for those communities. Just today, we just announced another significant equity partnership with eight Indigenous communities, three First Nations and five uh, Métis nations, uh, five Métis communities. Um, this, the, the, which we refer to the, to the Northern Courier Pipeline Project, the, this is absolutely key to what you just said. It's investment in communities. It's investment and economic prosperity that isn't paternalistic. Here's, here's something to, you know, as a support. It is active engagement that builds, that builds uh, capacity opportunities for the youth in those communities, confidence. John, in his introduction, talked about some of the issues associated with confidence. I mean, we're seeing real success. It isn't translated across the country. And I, you know, I'll, I'll wait, Madeline, because part of my, I, I, what I have to say next, I'll probably wait until you ask a question. But I just, I couldn't resist because Oscar, you just, you, you handed it to me. There are huge challenges, but I, I feel like I'm in a company that's living proof of um, with the communities we engage with of actually where the future lies and how we can accomplish great things together. Sorry, Madeline, Perfect. that wasn't thank what you were expecting. No, 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 no. Thank you, Martha, because it's it's important that you know we actually see big companies like Suncor make these investments and, and to be able to use that as an example for other large corporations around the country of what they can do. So building on that, Mike, you know, how do we ensure that, that there is real support and in inclusive practices, especially in technology, to address the disparity that we see in the virtual landscape that affect our Indigenous youth? Well, just uh... Uh, thank you for the question. Um, I think one of the things we have to uh, first understand is, is where we are, uh, as uh, especially in areas that uh, uh, are, are not urban, you know, large urban centers, where we are with connectivity. And I'm always amused when um, evening uh, commentators uh, um, from, let's say, our national news will we'll switch to an Indigenous commentator, and uh, often on television they find them in their car. Uh, and uh, using, you know, using their cell phone and you think, well, wonder why that is. Well, it's because they've had to drive some distance to connect to, you know, the, the Wi-Fi at Tim Hortons. And so uh, and I see our colleagues from Whitehorse, for example, are on today. And um, um, I know that uh, Yukon University had had recently introduced the idea of parking lot Wi-Fi for those people who couldn't get connect connected at their home, somewhere to drive to, somewhere to connect, somewhere to download and upload. And so it, it might be really helpful to sort of describe the landscape. And I think uh, building bandwidth has done this and given some sense of where the real deficits are. So how do we, um, how, how could, let's say, uh, increased connectivity really help us in, in the Indigenous community? Well, the first thing on a very practical level is that it gives us that, that link to the rest of the world uh, in a much more effective way. Um, which many of us take for granted when we work in an urban center is, you know, clicking it on, we're connected, and we can do our work there and, uh, and, and do all the things that are suggested in this report, you know, uh, be connected and be creative. So, uh, but in the Indigenous community, there's, there's a lot more challenge. Uh, one of the things I think uh, we have to consider is, is that connectivity is going to be like dropping a big box of tools on someone's table and saying, look, You've always wanted these tools. Here they are. And I think that's going to be a considerable amount of time before we're going to be able to use those tools to greatest effect. 
and also for our students to discuss what's possible. Uh, I think here at Inspire, we see that many in, uh, post-secondary students are directed to um, parts of the Canadian economy or careers that are very, very narrow uh, and, and haven't really considered what careers and options for vocation are out there uh, that, that uh, digital connectivity can provide. So I think the first thing we've got to talk about before we drop this big box of tools on people's tables is to say, here's what's possible. And here's how you can use these tools to get to get to where some maybe some place you never thought you could go. Yeah, and thank you for raising that, Mike. I know that I remember attending a conference uh, on telecommunications in my own community about ten years ago, and uh, you know, people in the room were wondering why our youth were not, you know, getting into uh, into the you know, telecommunication sector. And I was like, the quality of the internet is so bad that they can't, yeah. you know, do all the exciting things and, and innovation, innovative um, um, uh, initiatives that we see is happening in the urban centers because uh, they're working on technology or, or speeds that are years behind, you know, what, what exists in our, in our cities. Um, so Martha, you know, we've touched a little bit as Mike suggested, you know, that the past investments or the current landscape, you know, has contributed to this digital divide that that we see. Um, you know, could you maybe just share a little bit about, uh, you know, I mean, your company Suncor and is investing to try to sort of deal with some of that digital divide. Uh, what are those kind of real on the ground impacts? Uh, uh, that those communities are seeing from those investments? Where, how are, are Indigenous youth taking advantage of that? Well, let, let me be really clear about the word investment. And there, one of the questions in the chat was, was also, you know, oh, this is what we do for Indigenous communities. Um, just to be really clear, this is not, this is not a charity uh, in, uh, activity. We, in, we invest because we get value. We procure goods and services. Last year, we, pro we procured almost a billion dollars. Almost 10% of all of Suncor's procurement was with, was, was, was with Indigenous companies, Indigenous communities. But we run really complicated operations. And when I hear um, you know, across the country people saying, well, you know, we'd like to do more with our Indigenous communities, but we're, you know, don't take this the wrong way, but we're worried about quality. We're worried about, you know, consistency and, my, and our answer is you've got to come and see what what our operations are like because we can't operate if we don't have quality if we don't have consistency if we don't you know have stuff on time and and so you know our answer is this is not some paternalistic support mechanism these are we get value and and in and in that kind of relationship there's a level of respect there's a level of confidence this is not the way it always was. And, and I would say governments have, have in the past, you know, the federal government in the past, and I don't want to point fingers, but I think has really treated the idea of investment in Indigenous communities as being more, let's help, you know, let's, let's provide some supports. And I think the business community, the private sector has an incredible role. We know that from our experience, but I would say in this country, um, you know, we, we should be rallying the private sector to do way more of what, what we at Suncor and a number of other companies have experienced. Where I do think the opportunity lies for, for governments, and I did spend quite a few years in, in the telecom industry, you can't do that if you don't have the infrastructure with which to, to actually respond. So if a company like Suncor says, we need, because we're, we're in our own digital transformation. There's no question. This is where the future is going and we need more people who are comfortable with, capable. And it's not just, we don't need necessarily programmers. You need people who know how to work with digital technology and, 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 to not, and not just create it. Um, but you can't do that without, without full internet connectivity, period. That is an absolute, you know, those are, that's more important than roads right now. Um, so that mindset where governments can really contribute is in the area of infrastructure, not, not um, you know, donating to a charity over here or something, you know, it's infrastructure that allows communities 
and the people in those communities to then build their own resources and their own capacity so that they can have greater engagement. It's a, it's a virtuous circle without question, not easy. And, and the journey for, for Suncor has, has been decades long. But again, with the announcement just today, another major equity partnership is, we're just so excited about it and really excited about what the future might bring. But I, I can't, I can't underestimate, I don't think we can underestimate the importance and the power of the private sector. Collaborating with governments, yes, but I feel very strongly we have a, a you know, tremendous opportunity to make real, real strides. Thank you, Martha. So Oscar, sort of building on that, you know, because you mentioned about the digital divide in our Indigenous communities, especially in rural remote areas. And we hear a lot of Canadians sort of actually, you know, wondering why we should invest in, in, uh, in these infrastructure investments, um, including in, in telecommunications. So is tackling the digital divide in rural remote uh, Canada from in Indigenous communities, you know, important? And, and what do you think, you know, you know, would be the, the benefit not only to those communities, but to Canada as a whole, Oscar? Um, throughout my journey as a, as a reporter and, and learning from uh, business uh, individuals, the more people participating in the economy uh, only benefits the economy as a whole. And uh, for rural areas and people um, like myself living on reserve, uh, building that capacity um, could lead to, to more um, economic opportunities and building those digital skills. Uh, I'm a freelance reporter and writer, and I've even have to, had to turn down some opportunities because my cell phone wasn't working and I couldn't quite uh, get the um, phone recorder uh, operating because the cell signal was so weak or um, the internet might drop out and you know I, I couldn't possibly, I'd feel so bad um, trying to conduct myself as a reporter and you know they're going, what? I can't hear you. So I think um, as, as that sector begins to grow and more, um, you know, Indigenous youth become comfortable um, knowing that they have a reliable internet service or cell service, that they can start picking up um, more digital skills and being confident in, in taking on uh, different roles. Um, such as myself, when it, when it comes to like, oh yeah, I'll definitely uh, write for that because I, I know that's secure. And um, I think also, um, we are starting to see uh, more uh, more indigenous uh, businesses turn to online platforms to sell their products as uh, entrepreneurs. Um, so I think um, that investment um, can lead to uh, a plethora of different skills that are that are going to be coming to our communities. Um, as we fill out uh, different sectors. Thank you. And, and I think you're right, Oscar. I mean, I look at a lot of uh, economic, what we call leakage in, in my, um, not only city, but also in my territory, things that end up just getting shipped down south. You know, everything from producing websites to our own cultural video content because they get edited in, in either Montreal or Toronto, uploaded in Southern servers, and that the rest of the world actually has easier access to our cultural content. And if we actually had these infrastructure investments, we could see huge, you know, returns on investments that only not only support our economy, it actually supports our, our cultural revitalization. So building on that, Mike, you know, I inspire, you know, actually invest a lot in our youth already. Could you maybe speak to sort of, you know, how Inspired has, has uh, tried to help Indigenous youth during COVID in, in trying to deal with, you know, getting post-secondary education, in some cases, you know, doing it afar, online, and why is it we need these investments? What do we get in return, building on what Oscar just said? Well, I think one of the, the key uh, issues for uh, for post-secondary education and something that inspires trying to help with is that is connecting individuals to their community at, at a university. 
And so um, for us, we understand that a significant amount of mentorship is going to be required. Um, uh, it's a great, it's, it's often a great challenge to get an Indigenous student to, you know, find themselves in the lobby of the university or the college on the first day of school. It's, uh, it's a whole other journey to try and navigate that landscape and that, that space. And so mentorship, the idea of a, of a group of mentors who have, have done this before, who can reach out to them on a personal basis and help guide them through uh, the educational journey is absolutely critical uh, to people's understanding. I think the other thing too is, is that um, the pandemic has taught us to be, um, to be to, that have driven us, I think, more and more into isolation. So many of us find ourselves working in splendid isolation at our kitchen tables, and that's the way that we now navigate the world. And so um, I think the real innovation will come from, uh, from the in Indigenous community in the understanding that we don't learn as individuals. Indi learning is a collective e enterprise. And to take uh, Indigenous students and help them connect with other students on campus, work in collectives, uh, work together, learn together, that's, that's what's going to be important. You would not believe the number of um, students generally who are live in residence at Canadian colleges and universities who take online courses. The university is often within, you can see it from there, but they'll take online courses, sit in a solitary room, and not engage with the learning environment around them. And so what Inspire does is help people engage with the learning environment, engage with others, and treat learning as it should be, which is a collective enterprise. Thank you. Thank you so much. And and uh, just sort of like looking at the RBC report, I, I'm, I'm mindful of the fact that the report highlights that also Indigenous peoples are creating new businesses at nine times the Canadian average, and that we currently contribute to approximately $33 billion into Canada's economy, and it actually could be $100 billion. Um, per year, if we had, you know, these investments and, and a significant investment required uh, in telecommunications, um, you know, it, it really is the so necessary um, for many of our for businesses and, and to be able to actually grow an existing business or do new businesses. So I've, I'm going to, um, you know, uh, ask uh, you know, any of you to jump in um, is, is how do, you know, government and companies um, implement ways to look beyond traditional education models? So um, I know, Mike, you just spoke to sort of the what Inspired can do, but you know, um, maybe I'll start off with uh, with Martha. You know what you've already spoken about the Sun Core sort of, but what other companies and governments you know could do to actually go beyond the, the existing traditional education models that are in place. So that's a great question. Before I go there, I just I, I you know I want to say Inspire is fantastic. Um, so just a, a, a kudo to to Mike and to Roberta Jamison, who who your predecessor just um, incredible work that the organization has done for years. So just, you know, in case I forgot, I just wanted to make sure I did that shout out um, at some point. Um, I, I think the experience that Suncor has had is incredibly useful because it's not, it's, it's, it can be replicated. I mean, we, we procure, we now have equity partnerships, but we procure goods and services and I have to say an awful lot of the successes, an awful lot of the smaller businesses that we work with, I mean, we work with over 150 indigenous communities, right? right a, a, across the country. Um, it's sure some of those successes have encouraged some of the youth to go on to, to secondary education, post-secondary education, lawyers, you know, accountants, um, engineers, absolutely. And that's fantastic. Um, and, and MBAs too. But what we've really seen is that engaging in businesses and recognizing that you have a customer is helps build that 
that learning and that on the ground, how to run a business, how to, how to meet deadlines, how to actually make sure you have quality control, how to do best practices from other businesses in, in a similar environment. I mean, you know, I, I, I think in a couple of, of the chat questions, there are questions about, you know, the investment and the investment level in Indigenous communities has been lower. The investment level in Indigenous businesses has been lower. Investment follows returns. And returns come when you actually have businesses that have customers, right? One of the successes is that Suncor is a really big customer. And that then allows young businesses, uh, new businesses to sometimes fail, but that's the world of business, right? That's not, that's not restricted to any particular community. That's, that's part of it. But as you build and as you build those experiences, they're not coming from a high school or, an, or a university. A lot of those experiences, don't get me wrong, I, I, high school, university, fantastic. But I don't think it's the only avenue. And what we've seen has been um, uh, learnings that have happened almost as, aside from the traditional, let's what, what, what in you know, urban Canada, we might think the traditional path. So I think you know, the mentorship, the, the working with some of the smaller businesses, some of the suppliers of goods and services, working with what those opportunities are, the learnings are, are terrific. Um, and then what we're, what we're now seeing is the generational benefit of that, which uh, then goes back to the confidence as well as, you know, you, you, confidence comes with knowing what, what you need to do. And that's been very powerful for you. Thank you. And, and just mindful of time, I just want to sort of make sure that we also hit up a couple of the other uh, audience questions. Uh, one question was that are Indigenous um, leaders, politicians, corporate leaders, what are they doing to figure this out? You know, are they actually pushing, you know, to ensure that our governments and our, you know, big corporations in this country are actually investing? You know, is this a political hot, you know, potato? Is it, it's uh, actually, I just saw that I think all three national parties have, have raised finally, I think only as of yesterday, you know, that uh, the issue around digital and connectivity um, it being an issue, but I haven't actually heard it in the Indigenous context yet in this election. So Oscar and, and Mike, you know, um, what are your views? Are we actually seeing our Indigenous politicians and leaders, you know, really pushing for uh, these investments in, in our communities in the rural remote areas? Well, I'll, I'll just say that I think uh, um, we have to make um, the distinction between uh, advocating for investment, which is excellent. It, it, we won't get anywhere without that kind of corporate and government uh, uh, in, in investment. But we also have to inspire. And I think that's a, an, a, a, a duty of leadership, too, to tell uh, young people that uh, now that digital connectivity is arriving, uh, we really have to 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 let let them be creative with what they're seeing. Uh, too much of our uh, too often our young people are sort of insulated from the rest of the possibilities of what uh, the Canadian economy have for them because they just aren't connected to it. They just don't have that uh, um, that daily contact with what might be possible. So I think there's a there's an inspirational element to this to say you can be this, you can do this. Um, these tools are available to you, as well as as investment, and I think both of those have to be balanced. Oscar, yeah, uh, I would just you... uh, hmm? oh, go ahead. Yeah, uh, I would just like to say that yes, uh, on kind of the grassroots level, I've definitely seen uh, chief and councils uh, investing um, or bringing in uh, other technologies, especially with uh, more um, at home learning. Um, being required because of COVID, but um, I'd also like to highlight um, some of the programming that tries to blend uh, traditional knowledge, traditional Indigenous knowledge with some of the kind of digital skills that people are picking up, um, kind of the, the land-based uh, education going on in uh, Escazoni and mixing that in with um, allowing students to know that um, Indigenous people have been scientist for, for a millennia, that we've always been uh, innovative and creative in the ways in which we know and continue to learn. So uh, 
it's allowing students in an environment to know that our people were once grounded in science also, and they can uh, pick up those skills too. Thank you. Excellent. The excellent. And, and I would say that uh, one new concept that I had learned from participating in Indigenous um, um, events with the Internet Society of Canada is uh, in the United States, New Zealand, even in Mexico, is the existence of Indigenous spectrum and really trying to push our national organi Indigenous organizations to begin to even, you know, have our national government recognize that it is a resource that we shouldn't actually have uh, a spectrum allocation because that would actually allow us to even begin to utilize that to enter into partnerships, get more investments and build out the, the telecommunication infrastructure that we desperately need in our communities. Because I agree with you, Oscar, you know, we are, we've always been innovative and we will use this technology possibly very similar or very differently and uniquely in, in our respective uh, communities. So I'm going to, I, I really apologize for everyone, you know, for not getting to all your questions. Um, and I'm going to see about if we can possibly tackle one more very quickly. Um, in the 2017 report of the National Indigenous Economic Development Board, it found that Indigenous businesses get roughly 10 times less access to investment capital. We know that it, we struggle to get you know, access to those investments or even investments you know, to be made on our behalf. What can we do to sort of actually, you know, again, you know, ensure that we get the, the investments made into our communities? Uh, quickly, uh, anyone of the panels have, uh, have some insight that you might want to share? Well, I, I think, uh, Madeline, that was, I'd seen that question and it was one of the ones that spurred me to talk about the importance of customers. Um, uh, you know, and I, and, and I just think that um, we need to remember that investment follows returns. Re investment is there to support um, ultimately a financial return. And the financial return comes from successful businesses and su successful businesses come from having customers. Um, and and I, what I would just say, and I, and I think it might be repeating, but it's worth repeating. There are so many companies and businesses across Canada um, that have asked us, well, how, you know, how does Suncor do this? And, you know, we're not sure, but I said, as I said earlier, we're not sure about quality and we're not sure about, listen, I hear the federal government say that kind of thing all the time, right? And our answer every single time is come and see our operations. Um, the proof is in the pudding. So, so there is a bit of an educational component for the potential customers that, that needs to happen before you can say, well, let's invest because it's a, it's a circle. Mm -hmm. So in closing is that, you know, we've always known that, you know, good strategic investments in our rural remote northern indigenous communities have always proven to be a good investment, not only for those communities, but for our country. We've proven that over and over again, and we just need to keep doing that. So I'd like to thank everyone. I know that there's so much more that we could say. I apologize for not being able to get all the audience questions. I'm pretty confident that the panelists, you know, um, are generally easily findable. I know I am. Uh, we really do care and very passionate about ensuring that there is Indigenous connectivity and, and investing in our youth and so that we can contribute not only to our local economies, but our national economy. So I'm going to take this time to hand this back to Jennifer to wrap up our session. Thank you. Thank you so much, Madeline. Thank you, Oscar Baker III, Martha Halfinlay, Mike DeGagne, John Stackhouse and everyone at RBC for making this conversation possible in the Building Bandwidth Report. You know, throughout the last hour, I sometimes forgot I was hosting it because I was so into the conversation. A lot of takeaways, concrete action items for individuals and institutions. Thank you as well to our annual sponsors, which include Inspire, thank you, Mike, Labat Breweries of Canada, 
Air Canada, Shaw, and Facebook Canada. And thank you all for joining us. Very active chat with reflections. Uh, hello, so it's great to see where you're all joining us from, uh, as well as questions, which really informed our conversation. We really appreciate all of that engagement. If you enjoyed today's event, there's more coming up. On Thursday, September 23rd, so that's next week, Facebook presents the Walrus Talks at Home News and Platforms. And then on Tuesday, October 19th, TD Bank Group presents the Walrus Talks at Home Reimagining Resilience. You can check out the walrus.ca slash events to see our schedule. We also post videos from all our events. So if you want to share this with someone, look for the video soon on that page. Also, keep an eye on your inbox. The best way to stay in touch with the walrus is to opt into our newsletter. That way you will not miss an event. At the Walrus, we really believe that trustworthy journalism is an essential service, especially in these times. And with your support, we can continue to do what we do, which is providing fact-checked, thought-provoking journalism that Canadians can rely on. So if you enjoyed this free event, consider making a donation. Just go to our website, thewalrus.ca, click on Donate, and all donations, $20 or more, receive a charitable tax receipt. Community is really important in these COVID times, and each one of you is part of the walrus. Thank you so much for joining us. Enjoy your day and week and weekend ahead. All the best.